this video, we're going to look at separate compilation using header files in C. And then we'll do a small sample program that uses separate compilation and header files and also shows how to use structs. Separate compilation is a technique where we can break a program down into multiple files. And one of the big benefits here is that it saves time when we make changes to those files. Because if I make a change to just one of the files, with separate compilation, only that file has to be recompiled instead of recompiling the whole project. Of course, saving time isn't always a benefit, as this episode of XKCD shows. The other benefit of separate compilation is it allows for greater reuse, because we can make a single file, for example, that defines a bunch of functions having to do with points, uh, like we saw in an earlier example, and then we can use that file in multiple projects, and so it makes it easier to distribute that point code and use it in multiple places. Let's look at a few details on separate compilation here. Suppose we had a project that had a point, and then we had a geometry project that we were trying to use that in. And so for a project like this, we might actually divide it out into three different files. And the first file here is called point.h, and that's what we call a header file. And it's called a header file because it's going to declare function headers, but not the bodies of the function. So the header of a function is just that first line that says what the return type is, and the name, and the parameters, and their types, um, but doesn't have the body. And we'll look at an example of that in a minute. The point header file would also declare any custom types and structs that are used to represent points. Then separate from that, we can have a point.c file, and inside that file, it will have a command that says include point.h. It says I want to use the types that are uh, and structs that are defined in point.h, and then point.c will actually give the content of those function bodies. And so now if I change the definition of those functions, I only have to change that one file, point.c. And then finally, I might have this geometry file that does some uh, geometry calculations, and it also would include that point.h header file. And it can use the types and the structs and the functions there. And if I make changes to geometry but leave point alone, I can separately compile geometry. I don't have to worry about recompiling point. Similarly, if I went in and I changed how I implemented a point uh, function to make it more efficient, I wouldn't have to recompile the geometry program. I could just take advantage of that. So here's a, an example of what a header file might look like. This is a header file that might be uh, the point.h. At the beginning of the file, we have this if ndef command. And this says that if we haven't already defined point underbar h underbar, then go ahead and, and execute all the code inside this down to the endif directive at the bottom of the file. So this is way multiple uh, files can include this without redefining things or having them defined more than once. So if we haven't defined point.h, then the C preprocessor will hit the second line here. It says, OK, go ahead and define it. And so now if the C compiler tries to include uh, the point header anywhere else, now point h will be defined. And so we won't have this uh, set of definitions done a second time. And then after that, we go ahead, we have our type def for the point struct, and then we have the headers for a couple of functions. And again, notice that these just end with a semicolon. In the header file, I don't give the actual body of the function. I'll do that separately in the point.c file. So now I'd like to do an, a programming example using these things. And this example is going to be drawn from something called computational geometry. And that's just a branch of computer science that deals with solving problems using geometry. An example of an interesting application of this might be where an engineer is trying to design the software for a search and rescue robot. And he or she might use computational geometry to come up with a program so the robot could navigate through a collapsed building and find survivors. That problem is a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to be able to deal with. Uh, so let's start with a simple set of computational geometry problems. And the problem we're going to deal with deals with rectangles. And so we're going to write functions to construct rectangles, to query them for data, to test whether the rectangles overlap, and then to find the intersection of two rectangles. So these sort of ideas might be useful, for example, if we're planning neighborhood canvassing in a grassroots political campaign, or maybe if we were trying to assign volunteers to distribute food or blankets following a natural disaster, we use rectangles to represent that area. Or maybe we're determining the next state in a turn-based strategy game, and we could use these to calculate whether two players were in conflict. So we're going to start with some files that are 
already have a skeleton of the program here. So if you're enrolled in CSSE 120 or CSSE 221, you should be able to check out the Rectangle Structs project from your Subversion repository. If you aren't enrolled in the course, you can download the zip file that contains the files that we'll be using. So I've switched to Eclipse. Let me go ahead and check out the template project that we're going to be working with. All right, so I've checked out the project. Let me go ahead and open up Source. And if we look inside Source, we see there are three files here, rectangle.c, rectangle.h, and rectanglestructs.c. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. We'll go to rectangle.h first. So rectangle.h is the header file for this project. And so go ahead and under Author and type your name in there. Then if we scroll down, we see we've got our if end f rectangle header, and then we define it. And we've got a few constants defined in here, like Matt talked about in the previous video. So we have the report width. We define false and true in a Boolean type. We've got a point struct. Note we're using ints in this example instead of floats. And then we've got a place where we're going to need to fill in some code, and there's a to do here. And this is doing a type def to define a rectangle struct. So start thinking about what we want to put in there. We'll come back to that. Then below that, I have the prototypes or the headers for all of my functions. So I've got a make point function, make rectangle, get left, get right, uh, get top, get bottom, r intersecting, and intersect. And r intersect will check whether the rectangles touch. The intersect function will actually find the intersection of two rectangles, which will be a new rectangle. So if we look at the C file, at the top we've got an include rectangle.h. And one thing to notice here, that's different. In our previous includes, we've had angle brackets because we were including from the standard C libraries. Here we have double quotes around that to say that we want to include something that's in the same project that we're in. And again, at the top, we have a place for author. So go ahead and put your name in there. And then as we scroll down, we see that we've got all the functions where we had prototypes in the header file are actually defined in this file. And so make point is defined for us. And then if we scroll down further, we've got just stubs put in for all those other functions. And we're going to have to come in and fill in that information. And finally, we've got rectanglestructs.c. And for this project, this is just a test harness. So we'll run this, and it will do some unit testing for us and print out some results. But we don't actually need to edit that file. Uh, if you want, though, you can go ahead and run this project. And so if I right click and say run as. See application. Oh, better save changes. I'll see in my console, and I can double click on the console tab to see the details. I can see that a few of the tests pass, but mostly I'm getting 0% test passing. And so as we implement this, those numbers should get better. I'll double click on console again so I can zoom in. So now let's start working on some code here. Well, the first thing we need to do if we're going to deal with implementing these functions for rectangles is figure out what we should store in our struct. And there's some different approaches there. Uh, we might store the top left corner of the rectangle and then the height and width. That would be a reasonable way to do it. But for this project, I want to go ahead and use the point struct that's already defined. And so I can declare the top left corner and the bottom right corner that way. So inside the struct, let me put in a point P1 and a point P2 to represent two corners of the rectangle. So that will define my rectangle struct type, and I can save that. And now I'll switch back to rectangle.c, and I can start working on some of these functions. And so let's scroll up to the top. And so the first one I have to implement is make rect. And so we've got a partial code put in here. It says it makes a rectangle from the given coordinates, and it's made up of two points. And I've got x1 and y1 and x2 and y2. And I've made a rectangle there. And so now I need to set the parts of that. Well, my rectangle for the answer there actually contains two points. So I guess I better make up a couple of points. So let's do point P1 equals, and I can call this helper function up above to make a point. So p1 equals make point, and I'll pass x1 and y1 to that. All right, that looks good. So how do I make the other point? Well, that's easy. p2 is make point of x2, x2, and y2. 
So there I have two points, and now I just have to set the pieces of answer. So just like up in make point, I set the pieces of the point. Here I can say I want answer.p1 to get p1, and answer.p2 to get p2. And that takes care of that. Now I could have done that in one step. I could have said answer.p1 gets make point of x1, y1. That would have been fine also, but that should work. So I'm going to save that, and let me go ahead and run that again. And I can use Control F11 to run it. And of course, some of the tests didn't pass because we haven't finished implementing everything. But let's see if we passed any of them up at the top. And if we scroll up to the top, we see that we're making the rectangles. But our tests to see whether get left and get right and so on work, those aren't passing yet. So we're going to have to go ahead and figure out how to implement those. All right, so get left says it's going to return the x coordinate of the leftmost edge of the given rectangle. So can we just return the x coordinate of point P1? Well, we might think that, but are we doing anything to make sure that x1 in make rectangle is actually the leftmost point? Well, not really. And so if we want to get, get left working correctly, we're going to have to check and see whether x1, um, whether the, the first point's x is the least, the lowest value, or whether the second point's x is the lowest value. And so we really have two approaches there. We could change make rect to ensure that point p1 is always the top left corner. Or we could do a conditional in our get left and just check the two x values of both points and return the correct one. For this example, I'm going to go ahead and put the logic for deciding which point is the leftmost inside the get left function. So to do that, I guess I'm going to have to start out and check those two values. So I'll do an if, and if r.p1.x is less than the rectangle's point 2.x, then point 1 is leftmost. And so I want to return r.p1.x. Otherwise, then I know the other point is leftmost. I'll return r.p2.x. So if I save that and go ahead and run my tests, control F11 again, and look at the console, if we scroll up the top, all my test cases for get left are now passing. So get left result is 100%. So that's a good thing. So after the tests pass, then I should think about whether I can make this code a little bit better. And it seems to me that I'm going to have to be finding min and max and returning those values fairly frequently in this code, because like get top will be a very similar sort of thing. And I'm accessing x and y, or the p1x and p2x multiple times in this code. So maybe I can write a helper function to find the smallest value, because Imagine if I had a min function. Then I could write code like this. Return the min of r.p1.x and r.p2.x. And so that's uh, a nice abstraction there where I can return just the min value. So let me go create a function that will do that. So just ab above here, I'll say int min, and I'll pass in two integers, uh, x Oh, uh, let me not use x and y. Let's use a and b, just to avoid some confusion. And now the body of this actually ends up being a lot like what I was doing in get rectangle before. And I don't actually need this code in get rectangle, because the return min is doing the right thing. So let me cut that stuff out of there, and go up to min and paste it back in. And now instead of these complicated things, I want to do a and b. So a and b. And so if a is less than b, I'll return a. Otherwise, I'll return b. So you've seen an implementation of get left and how to tour this code. You can go ahead now and work on get right, get top, get bottom, are intersecting and intersect. And if you're enrolled in the course, we'll of course have time to work on that in class next time. Until then, I'm Kurt. Catch you later.